Hello, and welcome to today's discussion. Today we're going to pick up on where we left off the other day on different theories of perception. In that session, we had talked about structuralism and gestaltism. We talked about ecological optics. And we also talked about Helmholtz's view of constructivism. Now we're going to go a little bit further and learn some additional approaches to understanding vision. We'll look at an information processing theory from a psychological perspective. Then we'll look at a biological information processing system. And finally, we'll look at David Marr's three levels of processing, some kind of a computational approach that he championed during his life and his career at MIT. Okay, so we'll begin with the information processing theory for psychology, and we'll give ourselves just a little bit of background for this. This is a picture of Alan Turing, who is widely accepted to be one of the important founders of artificial intelligence. Turing had a very interesting life and played a very important role in intelligence operations for the British during the Second World War. You might say that on some level he invented the digital uh, computer. That might be a little bit too strong that he invented it, but surely he was one of the founders and he shaped the way that uh, the early researchers in this field thought about, their, uh, thought about issues relating to artificial intelligence. So let's make sure that we're very clear on what we mean by artificial intelligence. We can define it, as you see here, as the branch of computer science in which computer programs simulate intelligent behavior. What I'd like you to do is, in just a moment, turn the, computer, or turn the video off. I'd like you to see if you can generate a couple of examples from everyday life of artificial intelligence, given this definition. The other thing I'd like you to do is see if you can prepare a response to a potential pop quiz question that we might have in class I'd like you to generate your own example of how computer vision could have practical applications in everyday life. So this is now computer vision as a pop quiz question. And over here we have the question about generating examples of artificial intelligence that might not necessarily be related to computer vision. So we'll give you a moment to do that. Okay. When you're ready to resume, we'll go ahead and we'll talk a little bit about a different kind of model. Here we have uh, a model that we might call a connectionist neural network model. And what's interesting about this is that here we can see that we have some units, very, very busy diagram, and those units are receiving some inputs and they're putting out some kind of output. Okay? And we see input activation, units, connections, output activation. What we might ask ourselves is this. In the computer network model above, what are the biological counterparts to units and to connections and to activation levels? Input activation, output activation. Why don't you think about that for a moment? You can turn the video off and see if you can generate an answer to this question. You might also generate an answer to how do connectionist models learn? So go ahead and give yourself a minute to work on those questions. Okay, so if you're back, and you'd like to check in with some potential answers, we can think a little bit about this the following way. We can say that the units might be akin to something like a simple neuron. Okay? These, in fact, all these circles might be representing neurons. Okay? Those would be the units. The connections would be something akin to the synapses. Which neurons are synapsing with which, and so forth. Okay? And the activation levels might be akin to something like a neuron's firing rate. So, in any given time inside of your nervous system, some neurons are firing more frequently than others. They have different firing rates. And we might think about the firing rates as corresponding to different activation levels. Here are the synapses. And uh, the units would correspond to the individual cells or neurons themselves. Okay? How do connectionist models learn? Hopefully you've thought about that for a little while, but you might imagine the connectionist models, which are attempting to simulate what's going on inside of your nervous system, Learning is modeled, in this case, simply by changing the synaptic weights. As you might remember from Introduction to Psychology, some synapses are relatively strong, others are less strong, and that synaptic weight plays an important part in representing what an organism has learned. In fact, some definitions of learning are simply this, that learning is synaptic modification. In fact, why don't we make that a mantra for today? Learning is synaptic modification. Good, I knew you'd get that, okay? So the idea here in the connectionist model is we could try to model some kind of, um, uh, some kind of 
event like maybe memory or some kind of sensory event, and we posit nothing more complicated than these rudimentary units, these neurons, and their synaptic connections. And as the organism is learning, we might have a change in the relative weights of these. Here's a, a fun thought exercise for you. You can begin creating your own connectionist, connectionist uh, neural network model, even in something as simple as Excel. You can take this input activation layer, and you might put that in column A. You might take these central neurons, put them in column B, and these, and put them in column C. And as you might know, we can use all different kinds of Excel functions to have a particular cell, for example, monitor other cells. It might be the case that a cell is taking an average of other cells in the spreadsheet. It might be that a particular cell is taking the sum or the difference. It might be some kind of computation that is relatively involved or it might be relatively simple. But you can imagine that any one of those formulas in a given cell is going to be networked in some way to some of the other surrounding cells. So it's interesting to think about how something as simple as Excel can be used for rudimentary neural network modeling. I would encourage you to give it a try. Okay, let's go on to a different kind of model. This type of model is something that we might call an information processing model. And here we've got some different psychological phenomena shown in each of our boxes. Simple boxes are used to represent complex physiological phenomena and maybe even mental events, all of which are strung together in a flow chart. So here we have our first box, which corresponds to, for example, senses. It might be that we have just one box for all senses. We could have separate boxes for vision and hearing and so forth. The point is, according to this diagram, that feeds into some kind of a short-term memory. That might feed into some kind of a filter. And we can go on and on down until we finally get to some kind of response to our effectors. You might think of that as some kind of motor output. So something is coming in, something is going out, and these diagrams are simplistic. Some people would argue too simplistic. But what's nice about them is that we can posit some falsifiable hypotheses. Maybe it's the case that we're trying to understand how a particular behavior arises. And we might think that that behavior is largely governed by, for example, some kind of memory process. If that's the case, we would implement some kind of manipulation here and see if we get a change in the outbound behavior. An alternate theory might say that what's driving the behavior is actually not some kind of limitation in memory, but maybe some kind of limitation in the senses. And we might have a manipulation that distinguishes between those two. And information processing seems like this sometimes can be helpful in understanding how it might be that an output arises. And that output might be a motor behavior. It might be an emotion. It might be whatever it is. But information processing schemes are laid out this way, where, again, the simple boxes correspond to uh, things like mental events. One point to note about this is that there's a serial nature in this flow. And that's, a, that's described here by having something coming in and then moving along and moving along. And it's typically the way that we think about these information processing models. Some people object to this on the grounds that it's too simplistic because a real brain would be more in parallel. That is to say that we'd have information flowing back and forth, or that is to say action potentials flowing back and forth uh, in both directions and in all directions. There's a very famous type of computational model called a parallel distributed processing model. And the notion would be that, yes, we might have some sensory information, but the sensory information is going on at the same time that there's memory information going on. We have all of this going on in parallel, or going on simultaneously, contrary to the way that this is laid out. So this might be a little bit too simplistic. We might say that in a parallel distributed processing model, um, the activity inside of the system is parallel in time, or simultaneous in time, but distributed in space. That is, we might have some activity in our occipital lobe going on at the same time that we have activity in our temporal lobe. And all that is going on at the same time that we have activity way down in the thalamus. So that's not captured all in here, but it's maybe enough to get some predictions going. Let's return to this idea of mental events and remind ourselves about the group that we call the behaviorists. Okay, you might remember the behaviorists from Intro to Psych, including such people as Skinner and Thorndike, for example. Okay. Why would the behaviorists dislike the phrase mental events? You might think about that for a moment, and we'll have some class discussion about that. Okay, if you're back, let me see if I can give you some hints about why the 
behaviorists might not like mental events. The behaviorists bought into a type of philosophy that some people would call positivistic. In a positivistic philosophy, one attempts to explain things by only making recourse to what is directly observable, what is empirical. We hope that when you took Intro to Psych, one of the very clear messages that you got was that behavior is empirical. So the behaviorists are clearly fine with measuring behavior and trying to explain behavior because behavior is empirical. They're positivists, they rely on empirical observations. Interestingly, the behaviorists are also completely okay with making biological explanations because biology is observable. Now, in the time of Skinner and Thorndike, we didn't have some of the technologies that we currently have. We didn't have MRI devices at that point in time, but still, the behaviorists acknowledge that at some point in the future, we might be able to measure a biological response in the brain or in some other part of the nervous system. So, measuring a bio biological response is certainly something that the, the behaviorists would accept because it's empirical. But the claim here is that we might have these boxes that are corresponding to, hang on to your hats, mental events. Okay? Now a mental event is not quite the same as a biological event. An action potential is not the same thing as a memory. Right? That is to say that we can demonstrate that maybe somebody's got some action potentials, perhaps in their hippocampus. They may or may not be recalling a spatial memory correctly. So this mental event is not exactly the same thing as the biological event. So they would be a little bit reluctant to refer to such things as memory or such things as maybe um, uh, our phenomenological experiences with light and sound. Okay? So they're very cautious in their inference, the behaviorists, and they would maybe quibble with the way that we lay out the boxes here and what the boxes are corresponding to. Okay. We can ask about one box in particular. Here's a box labeled on your diagram as a selective filter. This box corresponds to Donald Broadbent's 1958 notion of attention. What I'd like you to do is think about that very psychological sounding term, attention, this, uh, this filter that we have here, and ask how you might define attention. And I bet we'll see some diversity in our descriptions and our definitions of attention across the room. So we'll give you a moment to turn off the, uh, or to stop the video player, and we'll come back and talk a little bit about attention. Okay, so lots of different ways of defining attention. Some common possibilities include that attention is the selection of a sensory event. That's a very S&P-like definition of attention. A memory researcher might say that Attention is a selection of a particular memory, but in our class we might call it the selection of a sensory event. Some people will define attention as the allocation of cortical resources. That is, we might uh, spend some of our cortical metabolism uh, on a visual event or on an auditory event and so forth. So different ways of thinking about attention. I look forward to your definitions as well. Okay, why don't we move on and talk a little bit about a very biological approach to understanding uh, vision. And here we have a diagram that is a little bit complicated, but you might have seen something like this even in your Intro to Psych text. So here we have the arrangement, the experimental arrangement, for a type of procedure that we might call electrophysiology. Specifically, this might be something known as single cell recording. And the notion would be that we'd have some experimental animal Frequently we use a macaque monkey because macaque monkeys actually have visual systems that are anatomically and physiologically and behaviorally very similar to ours. So they're a pretty good model for the human animal. And given the current state of ethics, uh, we, we typically agree that this is a permissible kind of procedure for a non-human animal, but not for a human. These uh, procedures are often very invasive, and we wouldn't do this on a human unless we had some other reason to be going into somebody's brain. Maybe we have to go into somebody's brain to remove a tumor, or maybe to try to remediate uh, severe epilepsy. But generally speaking, we wouldn't be um, putting an electrode into somebody's brain. But we can do that here on the macaque monkey, and here's typically the arrangement. Out in the uh, real world, we're going to have some kind of computer display, and that will allow us to flash some stimuli, and we can have great experimental control over exactly what kind of stimuli, exactly how bright, uh, how long they are presented, and other characteristics that we'll see shortly. 
We're going to show that to the animal. The animal might be anesthetized. The animal might be instead awake and performing. Different ways of doing this electrophysiology. We're going to have this electrode penetrating at a particular area of the brain. It might be um, the frontal lobe, it might be the occipital lobe, wherever that might be. The electrode is going to send a signal out to an amplifier that will make, uh, that will become evident to us through an oscilloscope where we can see the firing or the action potentials uh, as they are being emitted inside of the animal's brain and being recorded by the electrode. Sometimes we have single unit recording, other times we have um, a device that goes down and it contains multiple electrodes that can get into many cells simultaneously. Sometimes the electrode actually dangles slightly above a cell and we can have a field recording. We can maybe record from um, the outside of the cell rather than actually penetrating the cell. There are different ways of doing this. But in all cases, we're typically catching these action potentials. The neural impulse that we call an action potential. And there are a couple of different ways of measuring this. A couple of different dependent variables. Probably the most easily understood is something like the firing rate. We would call this a rate code. And we might simply count how many spikes we get per second. And maybe we're getting four spikes per second. Maybe we're getting 45 spikes per second. Typically for mammals, and you and I are mammals, and this uh, macaque monkey is a mammal, there's typically a speed limit. It's relatively rare that you would find a neuron that would fire more than 1,000 times per second. So if you've got a really fast-acting neuron, it would give you an action potential something on the order of once every millisecond. You might recall from Intro to Psych that there's a refractory period that sets a speed limit on just how many action potentials a given neuron can put out. Okay? So that might be one of the things that we measure. We might measure the firing rate of a particular neuron. Something else that we might measure is not just how many spikes we're getting per second, but we might ask how those spikes are distributed in time. So I'll see if I can get two rhythms going for us. You might imagine that one cell has what I'll call a quarter note rhythm. We might get something like this, one, two, three, four. So there were four spikes in that unit of time. But we could also get four spikes in that same unit of time, but they might be distributed differently. They might be distributed like this. Okay, so there were two sets of two. So now we have what we might call a time code. What's interesting about this is that we had four spikes in each case. So the total amount of oxygen that might be needed for that four spike event would be the same in those two different cases. So if you're measuring this by an MRI, you might uh, pick up the same level of oxygen. But if you have an electrode, you can say that, well, yes, there are four spikes in each of those cases, but they're distributed differently in time. So sometimes we're looking at what we would call time codes. It's a way of mapping out the rhythm of the action potentials versus a rate code. How many action potentials are we getting per unit time? You might stop the video one more time and muse about this. Is this arrangement more characteristic of what we would call basic research or applied research? And you might ask yourself why. So we'll give you a moment on that. Okay, let's go on. And we'll see if we can understand what is, for most students, a relatively difficult concept. This is the concept of a receptive field, very much related to biological information processing. A receptive field has a relatively precise definition. We can think of it this way, as the receptive field is the range of stimuli to which a cell responds. I'll say it again. A receptive field is the range of stimuli to which a cell responds. And then we can zoom in and ask about particular kinds of cells. So we might ask about a visual cell. And we might just modify that definition ever so slightly and say that the receptive field of a visual neuron is maybe something like the region of space to which that cell responds. So for any given fixation that you might have, maybe you're looking at the screen right now, some neurons are responding to what's going on in your upper right visual field. That's their receptive field. Others might be responding to uh, the lower left visual field the range of stimuli, or in this case, the region of space to which your cell is responding. That might be this, the cell's receptive field. Okay? <clears throat> so here, what we're going to show you is that receptive fields can be diagrammed using procedures like this. We can uh, show different kinds of stimuli, and we can map out really quite precisely receptive fields for individual neurons. We might find out, for example, that a neuron likes that region of space or offers action potentials to that region of space versus that region of space. 
Separate and apart from that, we can get even more precise. Using experimental manipulations on our computer display, we can put up different kinds of stimuli. Okay? Some stimuli, for example, might be kind of like a bullseye. They might have a light center and a dark surround, or oppositely, uh, a dark center and a light surround. And we might find that a particular neuron really not only likes a region of space, but likes a particular kind of distribution of light. Maybe it likes dark in the center and light in the surround, or vice versa. And that's shown here. On the left-hand side, what we have is a circular region that has some plus signs in it. And that's inside of a larger circle, circular region, that has some minus signs in it. And this is how an electrophysiologist might begin to describe the receptive field of a particular neuron from which she or he would be recording. And this cell might fire maximally if we have a light center, shown by the positives, and a dark surround. Okay? If we now uh, change that stimulus to have a dark center and a light surround, we might now get many fewer action potentials. So this cell might respond maximally to this, but very minimally to that kind of an arrangement, where we have now a dark center and a very light surround. And we can actually begin to classify different neurons that we might have in our occipital lobe or other regions of the brain, and we might describe them as being on-center off-surrounds, or we might describe them as being off-center on-surrounds. Two different varieties of neurons that might be looking at really the same region of space. So it's this kind of biological information processing that allows us to better understand the units that go into our, our visual system and make visual perception possible. So let's go to a potential pop quiz question here and think about these on-center off-surround configurations off-center, on-surround configurations, and so forth, and see if we can answer this question. Major theory of vision would be better supported by this diagram, structuralism or gestaltism. Why don't you think about that for a moment? Recall what structuralism is all about. Recall what gestaltism is all about, and see if you can relate that to this biologically de derived description of a neuron's receptive field. Okay. We'll go on from there. We'll talk about some biologists that had a great deal of success using this kind of arrangement and mapping out some early receptive fields. This is David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel. These folks were at Harvard University and in the 1960s and 1970s did some really important work for which they won a Nobel Prize in Physiology in 1981. We say that they're almost psychologists. We actually don't have a Nobel Prize for psychology. But there's a really nice relationship that these folks mapped out between the biology and some psychological events uh, that we think uh, is very impressive, and surely the Nobel Committee thought this was very impressive also. Here's what they did. They were back at this kind of arrangement, and they were mapping out lots of different kinds of receptive field properties using animals like this, and they came to define a particular kind of um, cell type inside of your occipital lobe. And the receptive field description is shown up here. What they found was that some cells in your occipital lobe, and the cells in the occipital lobes of macaque monkeys, will fire maximally, not only to how light is distributed in terms of on-center and off-surrounds, but also in terms of its orientation in space. So my arm right now is vertically oriented, and then I can introduce a tilt. A tilt, I can make it go all the way to horizontal. And there are some cells that respond maximally to the orientation of a, particular, um, of a particular stimulus. And sometimes these cells like edges. They like to see a dark light, uh, excuse me, light dark boundary that's vertically oriented, or a light dark boundary that's horizontally oriented. Sometimes they like to have lightness distributed in between two darker areas, but still a vertical strip. Here's a horizontal strip. So by looking at properties like this, something like orientation, Recording from the uh, occipital lobe, we can now get some receptive field properties. We can understand what kind of stimuli will drive these neurons to respond, these visual neurons. Okay. So some very interesting work here. Here's a really fun idea. We might ask how these are similar to simple mathematical functions that we talked about in an earlier lecture. You might remember that we talked about psychometric functions. We have uh, the psychological experience on our, our y-axis, we have the physical stimulation on our x-axis, and we can char uh, chart out a psychometric function. Using this kind of arrangement that we see actually over here, 
and developing these kinds of diagrams, these receptive field diagrams, we can go from having a psychometric function to having a neurometric function. And we can ask, as we're phys physically changing the stimuli, maybe from this orientation to this orientation, or from a light center to a dark center, what kinds of changes do we get in the neuronal response? So a very similar concept, okay, we're still changing from one number into another number, but we're taking in now a physical stimulus, and what we're measuring is the number of active potentials, as opposed to the number of, say, longer or shorter responses. But it's still a function, a rule for turning one number into another number, and these diagrams give us a schematic of how that might be the case. Okay. Let's go on to talk about our third and final approach in today's session. And this will be a computational approach that was championed by David Marr, who lived a sadly short life. He died far too early, uh, a researcher at MIT. And I'd like to give you three letters to memorize. These letters, and you need to know their order also, these letters are C, A, and I. It's not CIA, like Central Intelligence Agency. These are going to be CAI. C will stand for computation. The A will stand for algorithm, and the I will stand for implementation. And we're going to have three remaining slides, one for C, one for A, and one for I. And here's the C slide. What Marr would argue is that we can begin to really understand vision by trying to model it at different levels. The very first and highest level is what he would call a computational level. And what's a little bit counterintuitive about this is that the computational level wouldn't necessarily have to have a lot of numbers in it. We can even specify the relevant uh, variables here qualitatively. And he gives us a very nice uh, demonstration of something like a thermostat. Okay? So most of us are familiar with how a thermostat works to control the heat uh, in, in a room. On the computational level, we're only going to specify what the input information is and, it's, uh, and, and what the output information is. That's all that we're doing here. So for a thermostat, we know that the inputs might be something like this the temperature of the room. Okay, that might be one of the inputs to the thermostat. Some kind of a setting. Okay? Do we want the heat or the air conditioning to kick on at a particular temperature? And we would specify that temperature as a setting. So that's one of the inputs. The temperature is an input. What we have coming out as the output is some kind of a signal maybe to a furnace or to an air conditioner. And we might say to the uh, furnace, go ahead and turn on, or we might say you can stay off. Okay? So that's all we're doing at the computational level. We're specifying what the inputs are and what the outputs are. It's a pretty, a pretty simple concept, relatively easy to think about. Actually getting details about the inputs and the outputs is in some cases very complicated, but it's a simple idea. How do we map inputs to outputs and so forth? So basically, input information, here's the operation, and here's the output. Okay? So there's no specification here of how we transform the input into some kind of an output. All we're saying is that we have to define the inputs, we have to define the outputs. If we want to get to the specification of how this works, we've got to drop down a level, and that brings us to our next letter. And this letter is letter A, as we talked about. That's the algorithmic level. And now we're going to specify how the computation is going to be executed. Okay? So one more time, we had temperature and setting coming in. We had some kind of a signal going out to the furnace. A yes, turn on, or no. Okay? How do we do that? How do we do that? Well, here's the computation. It's a relatively simple algorithm. Here we're going to say that temperature is somehow encoded, however that might be encoded, maybe by a mercury-based thermometer. However that's done, we don't really know yet, but we're going to have some number that corresponds to temperature, some no number that corresponds to setting, and we're going to compare those two. So if the temperature is less than the setting, then we'll say, yes, we need to turn the furnace on. The current temperature is a little colder than we would like. It's below the setting. We need to warm up the room. If, on the other hand, the temperature is equal to or greater than the setting, we can leave the furnace off. So it's a very simple computation, but here again we're specifying exactly how um, these inputs are going to be mapped to some kind of an output, a yes-no kind of decision. In principle, a given computation can be executed many different kinds of ways. Uh, there are many different ways of accomplishing something by different computer programs. You probably have seen this even in your, your classes. If you've taken intro to um, psychology, you might have done a given computation a few different ways, or in research methods, you might have done a given computation a few different ways. There are lots of ways of computing a ANOVA, 
Uh, they're all, though, very formally similar to each other, even though they might differ in their detail. Okay? So what algorithm do we use would be the second level of analysis. Now notice here that we said we would encode the temperature and encode the setting. We might ask, well, how do you go about doing that? And that brings us to our final level. This is the level that we had represented earlier by the letter I for implementation. And now we're going to specify how the algorithm is carried out in some kind of physical device. That might be a computer, that might be a brain. Okay, whatever that physical device is, we need to have some kind of scheme now for carrying out that algorithm, which itself is operating on some computational inputs and putting out some sort of an output. Okay? So in the example of the furnace, we might have something like this. Imagine that you've got something like a thermometer over here. Okay? It might be a mercury-based thermometer. And that's going to be hooked up to this bimetallic strip. As the weather is getting colder, the temperature is dropping. And this might now come down. Okay? And it might land on some kind, of, um, some kind of piece of metal that will complete the connection. So once the temperature-driven metal is now uh, touching the setting metal, we complete an electrical circuit. And that's going to be enough to turn a signal on to send out to the furnace. Okay? When the temperature rises, this metallic strip will come off of the setting metal. And uh, when that is now disconnected, we don't have a complete electrical circuit. And so we're not sending a signal over to the furnace. Okay? So this is one particular idea about how you might implement the algorithm into a real physical system. There would be other ways of doing this. There are ways of uh, having different algorithms as well. But we have some flexibility at each one of these levels. But there's this nice hierarchy, starting out at the computation. What is to be taken in? What is to be put out? How is that to occur algorithmically? And then how do we build that into an actual model? So I hope that you'll think about these different slides and about Mars approach and about the biological approach and about the information processing approach. Think through some questions, and I look forward to seeing you in class.